All right, it's great to see you all here tonight for our study in the book of Jonah. The guys were kind of busting on me in the pre-service tonight because I was kind of late getting here. I was golfing this afternoon, and the people I was golfing with set a tea time a little later than was really convenient for me. I had to leave early to get here. They didn't mention that. That was a big thing, you know, for me to leave my round early. Actually, it was kind of a relief. It put me out of my misery <laughs> and how I was playing, but I made it. I'm here. I'm glad that you made it too. So we're going to continue in our study in the book of Jonah. Last week, Pastor Andrew took us to the end of chapter three, and he showed us how the king repented and God relented. And you may, re may remember he had some, uh, some visuals last week. I don't have those visuals this week, but uh, he uh, kind of brought it to life with the sackcloth and ashes last week and showed how the king repented. God relented from the calamity that he was going to bring on the city of Nineveh. <clears throat> And, you know, it reminded us of the fact that we don't serve a God who has already decided every detail in advance. We really don't. Uh, we know that God is going to accomplish his plans, but we also know that he is impacted by our prayers, that we really can influence what goes on in the world, and that God invites us to do this. He invites us to partner with him in what he's doing in the world. We forget that Jesus even told his disciples that they had real responsibility that would impact eternal outcomes for people here on planet earth. In Matthew chapter 16, he said to his disciples, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And there's a lot of discussion about that verse, but most people in our agreement that, you know, God is talking about the disciples and the apostles doing things that would have lasting impact in eternity based on those things, those decisions, and the influence that they have here on earth. So never give in to this thinking that God's already decided everything for us in advance. It's just not what the Bible shows us. He invites us to participate with him. And we have real responsibility to pray and to fast, to be agents of change, and to, you know, bring people into God's kingdom, into his good family. The Bible says we're going to be held accountable for these things. And so we take that very seriously. It's very important. Well, Jonah did what God asked, and there is a powerful result. The city repents. The city of Nineveh actually repents of their evil ways. And Jonah's obedience is going to result in significant change that is going to impact many, many, many people's lives, thousands of people's lives. In chapter 3, verse 8, it actually says that they gave up their evil ways, their violence. Pastor Andrew read that last week. Because Jonah finally obeyed, I, I like to think about all of the impact that that will have on so many people in generations after them in Nineveh, for, in Nineveh for so many good things. I mean, think about this. Because this city has repented, there are going to be people who aren't going to suffer from domestic abuse because people repented. There are going to be people who aren't going to live with a broken family because the city has repented. There are going to be people who won't be taken of taken advantage of financially. There are people who won't be sexually trafficked. There are people who will not be discriminated against. There are so many people who are not going to live in a dangerous, dirty city. There are so many people who are not going to grow up in poverty. Like, think about the incredible impact that this mass repentance would have on a city like Nineveh. So guys, we must never forget that we don't invite people to follow the kingship of God or the kingship of Jesus for nothing. Right? We talk a lot about eternity, and that's good, but it's not just for eternity you know, in heaven with God. It's, it's also for now and what God wants to do in the world and in people's lives. When people follow Jesus, it changes the course of history for people in the here and now. And when the people of Nineveh submitted to Yahweh, it changed the entire trajectory of their future. So with that in mind, I want you to turn to Jonah chapter 4, and we're going to move along a few more verses again tonight. Jonah chapter 4, and let's read from verses 1 to 4. It says, But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. This is after the city repents. He prayed to the Lord, to Yahweh. He says, Oh, Yahweh, is not this what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? We're just going to go that far 
here tonight. Let's break it down here. You know, I want to talk tonight about anger and how often it gets connected to our concept of God. And I want to show, take some time and look at that tonight. In verse 1, it starts by saying, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Now, one thing you have to say about Jonah, and you have to appreciate right off the top, he's very human, right? He's so human. He's just like us. He's repenting one minute, and then he's sinning again the next minute. I mean, we're so often the, the exact same way. How quickly he has forgotten the eloquent words of contrition that he uttered inside the great fish, right? This was not long ago. He said some pretty flowery things while he was there in this smelly fish. You know what I would have really loved in this passage? Now he, he gets angry again. He kind of turns again. What I really would have loved is for God to send like another fish right then and there, like out of the sky, kind of like cloudy with a chance of meatball style, right? Where the fish just like comes down, boom. He's like, Jonah? You got attitude again? Round two, back into the fish, time out. I would have loved that. That's not what God does, but I think that would have been really cool. But you know what? We're like Jonah. It's hard to say whether he truly repented or not. I think that he did, but we're just like him. And we, you know, we get our heart going in a good direction, but then all of a sudden it's going in the wrong direction again. We think that we've turned a corner, but we haven't completely. We think that we've forgiven someone, but then we realize, wow, I have to forgive them again. It's like my heart was there and then it kind of drifted away. We think that we've gotten victory over a sin, but then we slip up again. And we think that we've repented sometimes, but then we see that our heart has fallen right back into the same place where it was before. And guys, this is what we're seeing here with Jonah. Well, in verse 2, it says that Jonah prayed. Now, this is a different kind of prayer than we see earlier on when he's in the fish. This is kind of a prayer of complaint. And God welcomes all of our prayers, but some of our prayers, you know, they, they kind of reveal where our heart is at. And Jonah just puts it all out there. He explains to God why he disobeyed in the first place. He said he didn't want God to be gracious to the Ninevites. He's just right straight forward with it. And did you notice the language that he uses for God, all of the things? He said, I knew that you were gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, all that stuff. Do you remember us talking about this not too long ago? We did a series here at Renew Church called God Has a Name, based on the book by John Mark Comer. And in that book, he breaks down Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, let, let, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And we took the time in that series to really break this down. You can go back and look into the details of that. It was a great series. I encourage you to go check it out. But it's the most quoted description of God from God in the Old Testament. And it's a great passage because it really reveals God's character. It just kind of lays it out there. And Jonah was well acquainted as a prophet of God who knew Old Testament law and the scripture he knew what God was like. Jonah knew that God was going to give the Ninevites another chance. He knew it. As soon as God came to him with that assignment in the first place, he knew if he went and preached to them that God was going to forgive them and relent from the, you know, disaster that he was going to bring on them. Guys, we said this in the God Has a Name series. We'll say it again here. Note this. We all love God's grace and compassion when they are toward us, but others, not so much. Right? Sometimes we're like, they deserve it. They deserve to get everything that's coming to them. We lose that, you know, appreciation of compassion and grace when it's, you know, someone else in the picture. When it's us, we love it, but we want justice for everybody else. And it's crazy how much we struggle with this, guys. As modern humans, we like to think of ourselves as enlightened, right? Particularly since the Enlightenment era, that we acknowledge things like all men being created equal and loved equally by God. But when we get in specific situations like we see Jonah in here, how quickly we lose sight of that. How quickly we think that we're better than someone else or one group is, you know, to be preferentially treated over another. Now, we've been talking a lot recently about the blind spots that we all have as it relates to racism since the George Floyd event. And you know what? I don't want to move away from this too quickly. I think that we are in a, a spot here where we need to take some time and continue to reflect on this and talk about this. I think this is a real learning time and we shouldn't be too quick to move out of it. You know, for many people, the contradictions that come up as we look deeper into this, some of those contradictions are just starting to hit us. Some of us are just starting to see the blind spots that we've had. You know, the whole contradiction that, 
You know, America has this claim in their constitution that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that this constitution was written way back in 1776, while many of the people who were involved in creating that document right, and including Thomas Jefferson, who was one of the five that actually penned it, actually had slaves at that time. And some of us never even thought about this before, and we're like scratching our head and going, yeah, what about that? How could they even write a document like that? They even write in the document, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I guess they just forgot one word, right? It's the word white. All white men are created equal. Like, that's literally what they were thinking when they're writing, that had to be what they're thinking. Guys, my point in all of this is that we are very easily held captive by our own lenses, by our own presuppositions, and we become prisoners to our own unconscious biases that we hold. And often we don't even know, we're unaware that we hold them. These biases are often generational. They're handed down to us. It's kind of like the air that we're breathing and we don't even realize that we're breathing it. But this stuff is serious, guys, and we have to back away and look and analyze what do we really believe to be true? And are we acting on those things? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul said that we should demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I love that. Take captive. There's a different concept for taking something captive, right? Paul taught that there was actually an acceptable form of slavery. Are you catching it here? He says that we are supposed to, you know, make ourselves slaves to Christ. That's the only acceptable kind. Allowing him to take every thought that we have and every pretense and every narrative that we formed in our minds captive to what God thinks, to what Jesus thinks. Guys, let me ask you this question straight up. And I ask it of myself as well. Are we willing to truly reevaluate all of our positions in light of Christ? We say that we are. I know you're going to say that you are, but are you really? Are there certain things that you've kind of just locked away in a box and you're like, this is my idea, this is my position that I have on this thing, but you've really never stepped away and analyzed it and maybe never taken the scripture and looked at it a different way, or maybe have someone that disagrees with you, even on what the Bible is saying, and to get a different perspective that's really important, guys. That's how we continue to grow and become more like Christ. Well, one area where we all need to reassess in light of who Christ is and what he asks of us is in this ability to empathize. Jonah just did not have it. He was unable to empathize with this people group. He just saw them as an enemy. He saw them as different from him. He had no compassion for them. And guys, empathy is a very important Christian value. We don't talk about it enough. Jesus taught us to love others as ourselves. This was one of the, you know, center points of his teaching. Paul taught us to always consider others in the way that we behave, in the way that we make decisions. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And so, God, guys, I challenge, like, it, it needs to go way beyond this surface stuff where we just say, oh, yeah, that must be awful, right? No, where we actually stand side by side with people and lock arms with them and, you know, taste the salt of their tears and really understand where they're coming from. We need to strive to understand. This requires getting to know people, guys. You can't just do this by you know, maintaining a distance. This is what Jonah's trying to do. He's going to the city and preaching against it, but he's still trying to maintain distance. So guys, let's be intentional about crossing ethnic and racial and linguistic boundaries. Let's go there. Let's meet people that may be different from us in certain ways and really make an effort. It's so important. It's God-like. It's Christ-like. Guys, if we don't, we are just going to be poor representatives of Jesus on this earth. We're going to be poor representatives like we see Jonah being here in this passage. What a terrible representative. He goes and preaches a message of condemnation, but in his heart, there's no love for these people. 
Guys, the fact is this can get really, really bad and really ugly. And I want you to look here at verse 3. Look at what it says. He says, Now, O Yahweh, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Like, talk about drama here. This is ridiculous. Jonah isn't even making sense anymore. It's like, what, what's wrong with you? Right? What's so terrible now that you don't even want to go on living? Because these people all repented and so much good is happening in this city because of this message you proclaim. You know, when I read a passage like this, it actually makes me think of old footage that we've all seen of white supremacists in the South who got so upset when the laws started turning in favor of the black community. And you've seen footage like this, and you've seen the people, and how they acted like the world was ending. It was such a terrible thing. They acted like indignant little children who didn't get their way. And you can see it in their eyes and in their voice as they're yelling in the hatred and anger. You know, guys, I think a lot of those people had invested so much in that cause that sometimes, not always for sure, but I think sometimes some of them even forgot what they were arguing about. I don't even think for some of them that it was about race anymore. I think it was just about them not getting their way, that it was this whole issue of pride and that they didn't want to admit that they were wrong from the beginning and they didn't want to give up on this evil quest that they were on. And guys, I can tell you, I've seen enough of human beings and I've seen enough of human nature. I've seen this play out in so many different ways. I can tell you, I have seen key leaders in church denominations argue over specific doctrines and get in these fighting matches until they literally split the denomination that they were in. Not just churches, but entire denominations. Only to see those same leaders that were so, you know, passionate about these areas of truth that they would then go on and leave the denomination and participate in another church that didn't even practice those things. I've literally seen this happen. And maybe you have too. Guys, I'm telling you, this is messed up stuff. It's demonic kind of stuff. It just shows that people very often aren't even about the issues that they're arguing about. It's just all about their own dumb pride. And that's what we're seeing here with Jonah. Guys, this pride, it shows up in so many ways. I've seen this thing, and maybe you've seen it too, where people even get possessive of God. Have you ever seen this? You know, people do this in human relationships as well. Um, have you ever had that friend that just wouldn't let you be friends with other people? Do you remember having friends like that? They were so possessive of you. You had to be their friend, and if you were anyone else's friend, well, then you're not my friend anymore. Like, people literally do this. You think it's so childish, but I've seen adults that are like this. They were super exclusive and smothering. You know, people get this way with God sometimes. I don't know. It must have something to do with the way that they were raised. They weren't maybe taught to share with their siblings enough or something, but they just have a hard time sharing God with other people. They have this mentality, well, God is just, he's all about me and what I'm doing, and I'm always right, and God's always on my side, and, and if he's on my side, then he can't be on your side. And you have to get on my side because God and I, we're, we're close, right? I've seen people that act this way, and it's nothing but immaturity and pride and often manipulation as well, a lot of manipulation. Note this, guys. God loves all of his children impartially, and he sees all of our strengths and our weaknesses in perfect clarity. So whenever you're wishing and you're praying that, you know, God would show somebody their evilness and their wrongness and all of the things that they're doing that aren't pleasing to God, remember that God has things to show you too. It's a perspective that I always try to keep. You know, dumb pride makes us jockey for position with God. But it's really a waste of time. It's a very small view of God that would make us think that there's not enough of him to go around, right? That we can't share God together. I've learned, you know, over the years that God loves people who hurt me and who disagree with me just as much as he loves me. And guys, sometimes when people hurt us, it's very easy for us to demonize them and think that we're right and they're wrong and God loves me and God hates them. One of the things that I've really had to work at, guys, over the years is being a pastor. There's times when people hurt you. There's times when people leave your church and I've had people leave the church and hurt me deeply, but I know and I've learned over time that God loves them just as much as he loves me. And he understands the reasons why they've done the things that they've done just as much as he understands the reasons why I've done the things that I've done. And I know that while I'm seeing their faults, that God also sees my faults. And you know what? 
he sees some of the faults that I have that I still can't see about myself. And guys, that's a tough pill to swallow sometimes. But you need to stay humble in your relationship with God. You need to realize it's not all about you. And you need to get beyond yourself. Guys, pride can do a world of damage. Do you know how we get to this level of ridiculous childishness like we're seeing with Jonah here? I can tell you it happens very slowly. It happens very subtly. It happens when we latch on to little ideas that are untrue. It happens when we believe little lies that then grow and turn into big lies. And it happens when we fail to empathize with people way back in the beginning as we're getting to know them and empathize with them and really getting to understand them. When we fail to do these things, these such a wake-up call for all of us. How can a prophet him never to care about the people at all? How does that happen? It's easier than it looks, guys, for us to just go through the motions with people. Showing love from a safe distance. You know what, guys? It's, and guys, it's all about 20. This is not at all what the church is about, and it is not at all what renewing. Have you any right to be angry? The verb that's actually used here in Hebrew, translate it this way, is enjoying your little pity party, Jonah. That's really the, the feeling that comes through in the words that Yahweh uses here. He's being sarcastic in his rhetorical question. Guys, let me just end by saying this. Some of us have become set in our ways. We've believed a lie somewhere along the way. And our own pride is fed on that lie. Maybe it's the lie that, you know what? God has his favorites. And that would be me, <laughs> right? Yeah, God loves me. Other lies like, well, you know, God can't really love all of us. You know, he must love some of us more than others. And maybe you latched onto that innocently. Maybe you had parents that favored one child over another or who pitted one child against another. But however you learned it, it's wrong. It's a lie. And this can grow into huge issues of pride. And when God offers grace to other people, you know what? If you're like this, it is going to drive you nuts. So you like it when God's gracious and compassionate to you. Others, not so much. But God is telling Jonah, and maybe, maybe even he's telling you tonight, get over yourself.